Okay, so in the absence of Pastor Rule, who's in the uh, college career winter camp uh, today, uh, I'm, I have this privilege to exposit the word to you today, so be in prayer also for uh, Pastor Rule uh, and the, the rest of the campers that, you know, they would, God would protect them and keep them safe. Okay, so we're going through a series called New Beginnings, The Transforming Power of Jesus. And our theme verse is found in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Last week, we talked about fishers of men. We said that, in, you know, we need to serve in small things. And then submit in big things and surrender to all things. If we, you know, because we, the more we know about Jesus, we said, the more we will obey him and lead others to him. In the second message, we talked about, upon this rock and we said, you know, we will devote our lives to the cause of Christ, which he promises to succeed. How did we know that? Because we saw the answer of Peter when he was asked who Jesus is. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And the answer of Jesus, uh, uh, the, the affirmation of Jesus to Peter was that upon this rock, he was telling Peter, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And then he gave the authority to Peter where he said, you know, whatever you bind here on earth, it will be bind in heaven. Whatever you lose here on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so we said we will devote our lives to the cause of Christ, which promises to succeed. This morning, you know, we want to look at lessons from Simeon. Simeon who waited patiently for the Messiah and finally declared, I have seen your salvation. Before we continue, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that as we gather together, your presence may be felt in a special way. May your Holy Spirit continue to convict our hearts of principles that we could live by so that our lives may be pleasing to you and be an example or a witness of your light and your love. Empower us as we continue to learn from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, 2020, January came, and it was exciting. Just like anybody else, you know, I also had my own uh, resolutions. And if you were like me, probably some of you already have broken it, right? So I, <laughs> I resolve to, you know, increase my cardio activity. Uh, this coming year, I said I have to walk every day, and my gauge was, you know, walking uh, First Street from military down to the waterfront and back. So that's approximately about two miles, and it takes me about, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. So giving me five hours a week for five days, that would give me, you know, like 20 hours a month. And that was, you know, that's exactly what I needed for my heart. But it started raining. <laughs> and I, you know, I rationalized. I said, no, I cannot walk. I, you know, it's wet. And then the rain stopped. And then I said, oh, no, it's too cold. <laughs> so I already have broken my resolution. Amazing, isn't it? But when you look at 2020, though, there are some, you know, there are some things that we await for, that we are excited about, or sometimes we're anxious about. Let me give you an example. You know, for some of us, we're looking forward to March 3. You may ask me, well, what is that? That's the primaries. So for some of us, we're excited to vote so that we know uh, who the candidate we're going to support is going to be, right? For some of us, it is the presidential elections in November 3. For some of us, it is like, you know, you're excited, no way of finding out if, you know, you're going to vote, if your president would still be the, you know, be the president, or he'll, will he be dethroned, or, you know, uh, took out of office. 
For some of us, you know, we are anxious because of the, you know, because of what is happening in the Middle East. We're anxious that there will be, an, there might be another war in Iran. Or for some of us, you are still praying and hoping, you know, for uh, some um, medical breakthrough, particularly for those of us who have illnesses that are you know, that don't have a solution yet. And we're hoping for that, that throughout our lifetime, that would come out. For some, like me, I'm excited about how this new space force would look like. You know, we have a new military arm called the space force. So what are they going to fight for? Or what are they going to defend? They said, oh, they're going to defend the space. Whoa. So how does that look? I'm excited about that. But having said that, having said that, one thing that I know for sure is that we are one year closer to the coming of the Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. Just like Simeon had when he was expecting, you know, salvation, the child came. And because the child came, we have been saved, and now we're looking forward to the return of the king. My friends, this is a sure event. For we read in Hebrews 10:37 it says, "For yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay." God's timing is always perfect, and he says he will not delay. So he surely will come. It also is likewise a soon event. He says, "Yet in a little while." Okay? He will come. He will not delay. Look at what five, James 5.8 5, says. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. See, in this passage that we read, you know, in Luke chapter 2, we learn of a man who lived an exemplary life while patiently waiting for the coming of of the Lord's Christ, isn't it? His life gives us some principles on how to patiently wait for the return of the Messiah while living a life that is honoring and pleasing to him as we wait. That man is Simeon. During that time, he was the priest on duty when Mary and Joseph presented Jesus in the temple. Okay, for a background though, let's go back to verse 21. It says, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, this event or the, you know, this, this ceremony, uh, the circumcision and the naming happens in a local synagogue. So, this happened where Joseph and Mary were at that time, so they brought him for circumcision, and they named the child Jesus. Right? And then after that, verse 22, it says, And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So after the circumcision and the naming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Mary was still unclean. So she had to spend five weeks still to be purified because it's a male-born child. If it were female, she would have to purify herself nine weeks. So at least it's a male, so five weeks. So this event, the temple event or the dedication event happened after five years after the circumcision. Now, in this, it is in this temple activity the dedication of the child Jesus where the family meets Simeon. Simeon. And as we look at that event, Simeon's life teaches us three lessons if we are going to be patient in waiting uh, for the coming of the Messiah and living a life prepared to accept him. Okay? And therefore, to please God or to honor God, we first must depend on the spirit. We first must depend 
on the Spirit. We must be under the control of the Spirit of God. Look at what it says in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So what does this imply? Simeon is righteous and devout not because of who he is. Simeon is righteous and devout because the Holy Spirit is upon him. And it is through that power that he could be righteous and devout because that Holy Spirit is upon him. Okay, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, you find the Holy Spirit, right? You find the Holy Spirit coming upon people, coming upon individuals, like in Judges 13, the Holy Spirit came upon Samson, okay? In uh, Judges uh, chapter 6, the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon, okay? To give them unusual power to perform a specific task. So that's what the Holy Spirit does in the Old Testament. They come upon an individual to empower them to do a specific task. In the New Testament, though, it's different. The New Testament promises that the Holy Spirit is not only upon those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is in us forever. There's a big difference, isn't it? Look at what it says in John chapter 14. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you, what? Forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. So the difference, Old Testament, upon him, to, to, you know, for, for a specific purpose in the New Testament, in you forever. Now, let me give you an illustration to, to, to just make that clear. You know, Taal Volcano erupted, and it brought back many memories for me. Because the, the first job that I have in the Philippines was, you know, a vol being a volcanologist for Philvox. And a lot of you don't know that, huh? And so when I joined Philvox, the first assignment, I think they always do this for the newbie. The first assignment I had was to go to the volcano island and spend the week there monitoring the, the, the craters in the island. For, for, all, for those who do not know, there are like about 52 craters in that island itself. And so I came there knowing that you know, there's no power, there's nothing there except, you know, some farming people, and then there's one little store. And so I had to bring my supplies. So I brought a generator make, to make sure that my seismographs that I bring to monitor would run. And so I need to bring gas to power that, right? So you pour in the gas, turn on the generator, now you have electricity to power the equipment. And so the problem with that is, if it runs out of ga gas, then it wouldn't do its job, right? So that, is like the Holy Spirit upon a certain individual for a specific task. Once the task is done, it's gone. Now, for us, where the Holy Spirit in, in us, let me submit to you, we will never run out of gas. The Holy Spirit is in you to do and to will in you what God wants for you. So from our text, only in the power of the Spirit, as I said earlier, can Simeon be righteous and devout. So if you look at that verse again, he says, this man was righteous and devout. Why? As he waits, because the Holy Spirit was upon him, was upon him. 
Now, if you look at the example of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit, when Jesus was here on earth, he carried out his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Luke chapter 4, when he started his earthly ministry. After the temptation, and then he was empowered to go to do his ministry. Look at what it says. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And here is what Jesus declared in verse 18. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. So to set up liberty those who are oppressed. Even Jesus himself depended on the Holy Spirit's power. Ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit is doomed to fail. In fact, it will not work. I remember, was it Thursday? The, you know, it was, it was cold, it was raining, I think, Thursday last week. And all of a sudden, at the early, a teacher in uh, the mustard seed came to me, came to my room saying, the cameras are not working. Oh, no. Man, I don't know how to do that. Let me look at it. No. So I went to the monitors where they were monitoring the entrance of people, and I saw the monitor was blank. I said, man, this must be power. We need to turn on the power. And so I was looking, I was looking. I could not. And Maribel comes in turns a switch, and sure enough, there it is. So it's like that. We cannot work a ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. Only in the power of the Spirit also, as we live our lives, can we manifest the fruits of the Spirit. Look at what it says in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I emphasized patience because this is a characteristic that we need as we await the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the same characteristic that Simeon had as he waited for that Christ so that he could see salvation. So my friends, in order to live lives that are empowered, we need to depend not only on the power of the Spirit, we also need to depend on the direction of the Spirit. We need to depend on its direction. Look at what it says in 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So there you see the Holy Spirit guided Simeon. But understand this. As the Holy Spirit in us, right, provides power to accomplish God's task, he enables us also to do God's will. He doesn't give us the power so that we could do our own selfish ambitions, he gives us the power so that we could do what His will for us is. That is why it is important for us to discern the leading of God. You know, we need to listen to His guidance. We need to follow His voice. Simeon followed the Spirit's direction. He stayed closely in touch with, that, you know, with the Spirit of God that was directing him to do the things he needs to do. And then he continues on 27. He says, And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do him according to the custom of the law. So here, as he was on duty, the family comes in. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph comes in. Simeon was at the right place 
at the right time because he was sensitive to the Spirit's voice. My friends, there will be things that will miss out in our lives if we are not led by the Spirit. I remember when the church was planted in 1989 when we started it. And then the next year, we sent our first short-term missionaries. I think it was Carlos Salazar and my wife, Meng. So Meng was saying, come on, join, with, join me in the short-term missions. I said, no, that's not where I'm called to do. So, you know, God was still, I didn't realize, God was still preparing me. And so every time there's a short-term missions, people would tell me, come on, let's go. No, no, this is where I am. This is where I'm comfortable at. And then I went to seminary, and during seminary, I, you know, I found out what my, you know, what my strengths are, what my weaknesses are, and I finally heard God's voice saying, hey, what are you doing this for? So I look back, looking at, you know, what I am doing. I said, I've been doing, you know, helping the church, building the church, working for the church. That's not what I mean. What are you taking seminary for? So that you could be a better worker, you could be a better servant. And so that challenged me. And all of a sudden, I, f you know, I felt that burden of extending that training that I'm getting to others. And so that was what came out. And so after my graduation, finally my wife again, every year, told me once again, come with me to the short-term missions. I said, okay, I'll pray about it. And then finally God said, come on, you go. So I went. And as I went, as I obeyed, this is when I met those people that I needed to meet so that that burden in my heart of bringing that training to others would be accomplished. And so that burden became so strong that all of that, you know, that I, follow, I just followed it, and then all of a sudden, the whole project was done, was born. And so now we're in the process of constructing, and so hopefully, you know, it would be built and the training would, come, would, be, would begin. So my friends, if I didn't hear that voice, God probably could use somebody else, not me. Although it was intended for me, if I didn't listen, God can use somebody else, but I have missed that opportunity. My friends, many of us will face major decisions this year. For some of you young people, you probably are thinking, who am I going to marry? Right? Listen to God's voice. Or what degree am I going to finish or I'm going to take? For some of you, it might be a decision. Am I going to buy this house? Is it go, is, do I need to buy a new house or a refurbished one? Decisions to make. A new car, a new vehicle, a new career, or a new job. Listen to the Spirit's leading. But for some of you, it might be, you know, like, some difficult decisions. Would I hang on to this marriage? It's being difficult. Should I hang on? My friends, listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. How do you know? How do you know God's will? As we said when we were talking about the fishers of men, we need to obey starting in the small areas and submit to the bigger ones. Are you obeying? Especially in the things that you already know. Are you, are you listening to God's word? Stay close to its word. And God, the God of the word and his spirit will guide you. God's guidance in, is in keeping with his word. God will never contradict himself. And so, you know, as you feel, because feel is very subjective. Emotions are very subjective. 
always check it with the word of God. They come in hand in hand. And God's direction will never contradict his word. We need to make sure that our guidance is in keeping with God's word. As I said, those two always go hand in hand. And then he continues, look at verse 23. As it is written in the law of the Lord. Did you hear that? As it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That was what was dictated in the Old Testament, and that is what Simeon was looking for. Because when a child is presented at the temple for the service of the Lord, they usually offer an unblemished lamb. Or if they're poor, turtle, a pigeon or a turtle dove, right? But if that child is not you know, for, dedicated for the service of the Lord, the parents can buy them back with five shekels. So with that offering comes shekels. But here it was obvious there, were, there was no payment. It was all offering. And knowing what the word says, Simeon being present was led to recognize who this child was. My friends, it is only through the power of the Spirit that we will see the direction that God wants us to see. You and I cannot afford a moment to be out of fellowship with God. My friends, even Jesus himself, you know, Jesus himself was supremely blessed in his ministry by God because he fully depended and the De depended and obeyed in the Spirit's leading. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 4. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. This was after his baptism. The Holy Spirit filled him, and then he went to be tempted. With the power of the Spirit in him, he was able to get out of that temptation and started his early ministry. So, my friends, we cannot have the power of the Holy Spirit if we are not being led by the Spirit. That's why we need both in our lives. So if you want to patiently wait for the coming of the Messiah by living a life that's honoring to Him, we need to depend on the Spirit's power and on the Spirit's direction. Secondly, we need to delight in God. Delight in God. Look at what happens in verse 28 and 29. So the child was there. The family was there. Simeon comes in. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. So you see, for Simeon, worship was a lifestyle. Even the fulfillment of what he longed for came. He took the child and started praising God. He says, now your promise has been fulfilled. Now I can die. I can die. Let me depart in peace. Okay? So Simeon was a godly man. Going back to verse 25, he was devout, he was righteous, why the Holy Spirit was upon him. He genuinely loved God. You know? That is why his worship, as he delights in God, his worship is an outward expression of what was going on inside of his heart. It is an outward you know, expression of what is real inside of him. And so, for him, true worship is focused on God. In our church here, 
our worship or true worship is focused on Jesus. He saw Jesus and praised God, right? His worship before he met Jesus focused on his waiting for his coming. His worship when he held the baby Jesus was because the Savior has finally arrived. So you see, my friends, what separates our worship from others is that it is Christ-centered. Our worship is Christo-centric. We believe in the God of the Bible, the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we look forward to that day when our consolation and redemption will be completed at the second coming of Christ. Just as Simeon worshipped God while waiting for the Messiah, he worshipped when the Messiah was with him. For us, our worship will remain focused in Christ until that final culmination when he comes again. My friends, we worship because we serve a God who is sovereign, who keeps his promises. Look at what it says in verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. So here you see Simeon seeing what was said, recognizing who the Messiah was, praises God saying, now Lord, I can die now that you have allowed me to see this, right? My friends, if God is not in control, if God is not sovereign, then he cannot keep his promise. Those two things go hand in hand. It is because God is sovereign that he is able to keep his promise. So when you are discouraged, go back again and again, worshiping a sovereign God who keeps his promises. Know that he is in control and what he says, he will do. God keeps his promises to us. That is why Peter, when he was writing to the persecuted church, this is what he said. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Friends, having seen Jesus, Simeon was ready to die in peace. Now let me, let me share with you that only those who have seen Jesus are ready to die in peace. I mean, if you have been to funerals, you know there's a qualitative difference between those who are mourning, those who know Jesus and are mourning, and those who do not know Jesus and are grieving. You could see the difference. The question I have is, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you ready to die in peace? Do you have this assurance that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven and meet your Savior? Friends, Jesus is the only way to God. And later in this message, I'll give an invitation for you to trust in him. So you see, you live a life that honors him while waiting for his return by depending on the Spirit, his power, and his direction. Second, delighting in God. Worship him as a lifestyle. And thirdly, declares, Jesus, declare that Jesus saves. Declare Jesus saves. Tell others about the plan of salvation. Look at what Simeon said after carrying that child. I can die now, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. So as Simeon was sharing about this salvation that is in his hand, there's something that he knows that others don't. Simeon knew that the Messiah 
was for all people. Jesus was going to be the savior of all mankind, not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, all the people. Look at what it says. Uh, when the angel announced, you know, that the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ to the shepherds, look at what the angel said. The angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. So my friends, salvation is for all. So my challenge for you is to make a list of people you want to share Jesus with. Pray for them. Ask God for opportunities to be able to share the salvation Jesus offers. And then you share it regardless of what the response would be. Because although salvation is for everyone, not all will respond positively. Look at what, what the Bible says in verse 33. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Talking about Jesus being the Messiah for all. Right? And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. So there you see, there will be people who will rise because of the Messiah. There will be people who will fall because they oppose the Messiah. And then he continues, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So here you see Simeon says that those who oppose Jesus will fail. Will, they will fall. They will ultimately be defeated. It is, un, it is useless to oppose the Lord Jesus Christ because you know you will lose. But Simeon also says that Mary will suffer at Christ's death. Mary enjoyed a tremendous privilege of bearing the Son of God. But she also will be suffering greatly as well. So in fact, the word that appears there, a sword uh, in the Greek, it's a nuance for the word saber, a long, sharp sword. And the, the verb pierce will pierce through your own soul. That pierce is, you know, not once, but it is a continuing one. It is in the present perfect. Okay, so meaning it's a continuing process. So there are times, you know, when our stand for Christ will cause us sufferings, maybe great sufferings. But when those times come, our response is not to turn our back, back against God. It's not to be bitter against God. Our response should be to trust God, to worship Him, and to boldly share the word. My friends, are you patiently waiting for his coming? In the meantime, are you living a life honoring to him? Start depending on the spirit, both in his power and his guidance. Second, delight in God, delight in God. Worship a sovereign God who keeps his promises through Christ at all times. And then, of course, declare Jesus saves. Salvation is for all, though all will not accept. So just like Simeon, we're living in a time when Jesus can come back anytime. Are you ready? Are you ready? Maybe this year, maybe next year, maybe in the next decade, but one thing I know for sure is that we are one year closer to that imminent return. So this year, you know, I will walk in the spirit, worship God, and witness for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you that you sent your son to die so that he could be our salvation. And in case there is anyone here who is not sure that they are saved, 
who is not sure that they have put their trust in Jesus, I give you this invitation. Just say this prayer with me silently where you're at. You're telling God that I'm trusting in your son. Just say this with me. Quietly where you're at, just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, rose again. I hear and now put my trust in you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Father, I pray for those who pray that prayer for the first time today. And I pray that you would seal that decision in their heart to trust Jesus as their Savior. Seal that decision in their heart and make the Holy Spirit make it known to them that they are now children of the King. Father, for those of us who, have been, who are believers and who have lived lives that are kind of on the surface, not walking deeply with you. Father, I pray that you would challenge them to depend more on the work of the Spirit in them, allowing them to see that you are in them, Christ in me, the hope of glory, that it is through your power that we can do these things, that it is through your grace that we can accomplish these goals. I pray, Father, that you would enhance their worship for you and allow them to be bold to share your truths. Father, I pray that as we live this place, allow us to be bold for you, that we may be a strong witness of your love and of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.